Hello and welcome, 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 welcome. Today we have a very special guest with us. Might be the most special guest we've ever had. And I know I say that every single episode, but this time it's really, really true. We have the beautiful Ida with us. Thank you for being here with us, Ida. This is going to be a lovely conversation. And we're talking about something that I know is near and dear to both of our hearts. And it's being framed in the perspective of something uh, kind of interesting, but in, in, in essence and inherently we're speaking about alchemizing to your most empowered state and what that process actually looks like and what we are personally experiencing and exploring in that through our healing journeys, through mm-hmm. the lens of how to handle bullying. And so this is something we've sort of been talking about a lot about, but I would love for you to just say hello, introduce yourself in your own words um, by framing it into the conversation of like what we're actually talking about today and and just whatever is on your heart space in the most genuine way. Yes. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. My name is Ida. I live in Sweden and I came in contact with Karina during January, right after New Year. And ever since... We have established such a beautiful bond and I have learned so much from her. So thank you for that. And this topic came, well, we had a late night conversation. (laughs) It was very late for me, early morning, I'd say. And uh, we naturally came on different topics and we thought we should talk about bullying, Um, especially since Karina's dear young friend was experiencing bullying in her school. And we started talking a little bit about how, how we saw the perspective of bullying and adult bullies and our own bullies in our minds and in our heads and all that. So it became actually a heartfelt conversation to have, I think, for both of us. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said about the bully in the mind and that's definitely something we want to talk about and then you with these tiny coffee cups making me want coffee so bad back to back to center back to center <laughs> oh my goodness um yeah you know the topic of bullying is interesting and I definitely want to hear how you've personally experienced that Mm -hmm. Um, and we can kind of frame it in the context of that conversation I had with the young girl because it inspired this conversation and it felt it honestly felt really congruent and beautiful to have that dialogue with her in that moment because we were on the no way Jose call and then she comes in the house. It's, um, you know, the granddaughter's friend of someone that I've been spending a lot of time with. And she comes in and she's like, Karina, like, I've got the tea. We've got to talk. And But she wasn't, like, upset. She was just sort of like, just wait till you hear, you know, what's going mm-hmm. on. And I was like, okay, yeah, uh, no worries. And she went off and played. And then after the call ended, she came back. And she was like, so at soccer practice, the girls have been being really mean. And what happened, long story short, is they created a group chat of, (laughs) so ridiculous, um, of like all of the girls except for maybe two of them, including this girl, and put a poll in the group chat of like who was the laziest, who was the worst player who is like you know all of the different things being like the mean girls basically and you know it was she was really like just telling me everything everything every everything and um and I was just holding space for it you know and I asked her a couple of questions after she shared and first thing I said was like you know how did that make you feel and Mm -hmm. she was I was devastated like I thought these girls are my friends um and you know you know they've been like nice to my face but me behind my back and all of those things and then I was like yeah okay that makes sense 
And one thing she had said was like, she felt like the coach was going to just not like do nothing about it or like not do the right thing. And so I asked her like, what do you think the right thing to do would be? And she said, you know, I at least think like she said she should say that that's not okay or that that's not allowed on the team um and all of that and I was like okay that sounds good um and so I just kept asking her questions uh, around like how she felt and what should be done in her eyes and mm -hmm. um <laughs> what we decided to do is we put, we pretended we wanted to make it fun. Cause she was like, you know, obviously a little bit down in the dumps. So we were like, let's turn it into a game. So let's imagine that you are the main character of a movie and that this is happening. Let's play out like all the different scenes that could take place in this circumstance. Right. And I was like, nothing is off limits. Like you can say anything you want, anything. And so obviously I'm trying to like get, for one, I'm getting like her buy-in into all of this. And for two, I'm like creating the container in this space where she can like say that she wants these girls, like, you know, <laughs> but we can be able to experience that um, in a safe place. And so she is sharing about that and the first thing that she, the first thing that actually came out was that she said, um, well, you know, I could go to practice and like pretend like basically nothing happened and go to um, and wait until the coach brings it up and then, um, you know, pretend like I'm not hurt. And if the coach brings it up, then the coach brings it up and, you know, um, then we would talk about it. And I was like, okay that is a scenario. So I started writing down like, um, notes as, as we we're talking. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then I was, she was like, I don't know what else we could do. And I was like, okay, well I'll toss one out there. <laughs> and I was like, remember the movie, the princess diaries? Um, uh, and they were like, yes, we love that movie. And I was like, okay, well, you know, when she got bullied at school, she like had an ice cream cone and she just like stuck it all over the girl, you know, like well, you could do that. Right. And she was like, yeah, like we could do that. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. Number two, violence. Like, <laughs> you know, the first one we were like, sheep is that we were like, that's kind of sheepish. You know, it's like, let's be honest. It's kind of sheepish. Number two, it's kind of violent. Number three, <laughs> was like just totally sweep it under the rug pretend and these are like the ideas that they're starting to toss out now she's like okay well we could just totally sweep it under the rug and just not say anything at all like let's just pretend it didn't happen and i was like okay well that's super passive all right what's the next one and then katie was like you could walk in there and you could throw your stuff down and you could like have this big old outburst and like all of that stuff and i was like okay outburst got it um number five <laughs> and she was like, um, you know, we could, she was like, I could jump out on the court or not the court. What are we talking about? You know, the field for soccer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I could do like, you know, whatever, a backhand spring or what, you know, kick the ball and get it right in the goal. And then I'd be like, is that lazy? <laughs> and I was like, okay, caddy, I love it. Next. And you know, also like seeking approval because it's like you're being caddy, but like you're wanting, you're in, you're like, okay, was that lazy? Like you still want them to answer for you. Yeah. And then the next one was um, you know, walking in there and being like getting like super confrontational, like being not like an outburst where you're just like emotions everywhere, but like being like hey you did this and i feel this kind of way and like being kind of defensive about it and we were like all right that's another circumstance and then finally she was like i don't really like any of these options in reality and i was like good <laughs> good but it was fun to like, get out, right? creating a space where she can express all of those feelings so those are like real feelings that she's experiencing but then also I mean, like, okay, so I kept saying in context to all of this, like, what we're doing is we're, let's like lift up into the most empowered state. Like, let's keep getting more and more empowered from like being sheepish all the way up to at least being confrontational. But what does it look like to actually take charge in that circumstance? Mm -hmm. And so what 
I suggested, and I knew I was going to suggest this from the beginning, but I wanted to work through the process with her first. I was like, well, I have an idea. And she was like, tell me, like, I need to know, like, what can I do? And I said, well, we could process what you're actually experiencing on principle and write it out and be proactive instead of just waiting for the coach to like bring it up. And then you'll see if it ends up getting talked about or not Mm -hmm. and say to the coach one, like, I have something that I want to share with the team. That's on my Mm -hmm. heart based on everything that's happening. And two, have us write something out that you can actually like stand up before practice, not like during, like not like after practice, by the way, like, no, like in the very, (laughs) everyone's there. And you say, this is happening. This is how I feel about it. And this is why it's not okay. But even deeper than that. So we got, we agreed. We're like, okay, we're going to do it. You know, but I didn't try to convince her. I just told her, we just went through the whole options, like in the movie who would be the most empowered character in that movie? Mm -hmm. She was like, no, I have to do it. Like I have to. And I was like, okay, cool. So then what does that look like? So from there, um, I just kept asking questions. I was like, what are all of the things that you like would want to say, or that, that, that what's like the speech that that character in that movie would give to Mm -hmm. be in the most empowered state? And obviously I, I kind of gave some direction and ideas and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, inevitably, this is what we wrote out just for time's sake. <laughs> so not like the whole speech, but just like the different bullet points, right? We came up with 10 bullet points and then we ordered them, all list them in order. Um, but this is what she ended up actually doing and sharing. So mm-hmm. she, number one, acknowledged the toxicity in the environment. And number two, she brought up that it made her uncomfortable. I wrote like discomfort and passivity. So how it made her uncomfortable that the, that the environment was so toxic and that no one was just, everyone was just going to not talk about it. Like everybody knew about this poll and nobody was going to say anything, mm. you know? And number three, just observing what that is from like a broader perspective, you know, not from a woe is me, like I'm being bullied kind of perspective, like a, huh, interesting phenomenon that's Mm -hmm. happening here. And number four, I was like telling her, you know, let's bring this like broader, like on principle, what is a team? And Mm -hmm. she was like, oh, like, you know, what is a team? Like, what does a team actually mean? What does it mean to be um, collectively working toward the same goal with people that you're, you know, supposed to care about. And then in transmutation sake, number five is being encouraging and Mm -hmm. that teamwork being like, you know, to me, a team is us actually sharing a common goal and coming together in the commitment that we're going to make each other better. Mm -hmm. And The number six would be like acknowledging that criticizing and treating someone like they're a lesser is not teamwork, which happens a lot, actually, because we even when we care about people, just like a side note, we want to see them improve. And so we're like, you're not being this. You're not being that. If you were that, then you would be like this. And it's like, okay, it's not actually uplifting me. No, testing their limits in a way. Yeah, which there's it's necessary to push people, but at Mm -hmm. what cost sometimes, you know? Um, And so that's interesting. Um, And that's one of the things it's like, if you're criticizing me, even if you care about me and treating me like I'm lesser, number seven, you must be really insecure in yourself because that's the only reality of that scenario. And so not pointing the finger and saying like, I know that you all are also insecure and that's why you told me I'm lazy. No, just like in the high road being like, I know that if a person is criticizing another person, it means that they are really insecure within themselves. And then transmuting that again, number eight, everyone's valuable. We, I, I also used it as a, 
uh, opportunity to talk about assets and liabilities. And so I told her, you know, like everyone's an asset, like everyone has something that they can contribute collectively, right? Mm -hmm. And individually. And so bringing that into the reality that when we confront our insecurities, we're able to see like everybody is an asset. And that's mm -hmm. number nine, like the togetherness aspect, like let's come together as a team. If, if we're supposed to be a team, let's be a team and find safety and create and co-create safety in what we love. And so that was the process of how we walked through that together. And I just saw her yesterday um, and she shared with me, she was like, I did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did it. I, I, you know, at the beginning of practice, I stood up, I spoke to all of them and I told them how I felt. And, you know, mm -hmm. all, almost every single one of them responded really powerfully. One of them still had an attitude, she said, but she was like, but I didn't even care because I knew that that had to do with her and not me. Mm -hmm. And I knew it didn't have to do with the fact that they think I'm lazy. And I know that the, them thinking I'm lazy doesn't have anything to do with my actual abilities. And she was just going on and on. And I was like, wow. And one of the conversations we had, and that's where I want to sort of shift this after the story um, into more us like, you know, getting into it, um, was just her saying and acknowledging that like, she was so glad that she knew she could come home and that she could talk to me. Mm. And she, she was like, the whole time I knew that I was going to go home or come over and tell Karina what was happening and talk to her about it. And I felt, well, I'll get into how that, that what, what came up to me through that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I realized, and I shared that with her was like, if we didn't have this conversation, like she could have had the word lazy in her mind for like the next 30 years. That's crazy. <laughs> Like the power of one thought, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. That is also for her situation. The, the good thing in her situation is that the people she spoke to had their own opinion. They were not forming their opinion based on another person in that group. Where most commonly, let's say there's one main bully and the other are followers. And they know their inner truth, but they are too afraid to speak it. So instead, they form their personality based on the main bully. So for her situation, I'm so happy that she had at least a few of the people responding with a positive, um, yeah, a positive response. Whereas would it be a completely different scenario, perhaps her situation could have become worse where they bully her even more based on the fact that she shows vulnerability or is open about what is happening. Yeah. So that's the, that's the difficult thing with bullying is you don't know what the outcome is based on how you confront them. It is always a game. It's a game of chance really. Mm -hmm. If it's going to become, if it's going to backlash and become a way worse type of bullying, mm -hmm. or if they actually come to their senses and see that their behavior is inappropriate. Absolutely. That's so true. And that was one of the things we talked about too. And that's why it's not just about confronting. It's about literally alchemizing into the most empowered state. Because when we, by the time we were at the end of that conversation, it didn't matter at all to her what their response was. Mm. And that's where it's like actually the empowerment piece because mm. otherwise you're absolutely right. And we talked about that too. You know, we like played out the scenario of the movie, like what could mm. happen. Um, and you're right. You know, there are definitely, and I have, uh, I have actual personal anecdotal experience of that. Like the more that I stood up, the worse it got. Mm -hmm. um and my situation was a little bit different we can we could get into that too if we want to i mean it was interesting um to work through that with her and i was so proud of her because um 
it was so clear that she had gone from being like, how could they think I'm lazy? Like I work so hard, like, you know, mm -hmm. I, all of the, like trying to like make sense of it into being like, oh, I know this doesn't have to do with me. And that was super powerful because it went from like, she had in the beginning was still like going back and forth about that in her mind. I was like, it's not going to make sense mm. yeah. because it doesn't have to do with you. Exactly. I was like, they could have, they could flip the script and say you were a try hard, mm -hmm. like doing all of the things. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like that is not about your actual performance. Mm. It's about something else underlying here, you know? Mm -hmm. And and then I was so proud of them both too, because they were like, and we were holding compassion and space, like, okay, what's going on in their lives that's making it okay to treat people like that? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's when they were starting, like, I wonder how their home life is like. Oh, I wonder what their brother and sister treat them like. Oh, I wonder what they, the bully in their mind is like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere. And for me, it was like, after that conversation and during too, it was interesting because I, the bully in my mind had been pretty active this day. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been kind of active. And it's interesting mm -hmm. because I, the bully in my mind is like, you know, um, be better like be like you're not showing up properly like you're not doing like i have very high standards for myself and i see mm -hmm. how i can't like i have this like self image of myself that i think is like important to like have a trajectory mm -hmm. but if they're bullying like because i'm not fully there like that's not healthy and i'm aware of that mm -hmm. and <clears throat> It's like this um, need to do or like be or show or prove type of thing. And it's interesting because the actuality of that is just like being myself, mm. which is like free of all of the, those things and criticisms. And I'm aware of it. So it's interesting. But I'll just share that like from the start of that conversation, like being so present in that space of, of having that conversation and all the way through and afterward, I was like, because at one point she was just like, you, Karina, like, you would make a great therapist. And I was like, I'm not going to be a therapist. I was like, I don't want to be a therapist. I'm going to be a mom. And she was like, oh, you know, and I was just like, so I felt so congruent in those mm -hmm. moments. I felt so like, yeah, like this is the best version of me. I mean, this is my dream job. Like, this is what I'm here to do. And deeper than that, also, like, um, and in the community aspect of what we're talking about, moving forward, like, building families in a totally new way, um, I'm looking forward to, like, my kids never experiencing that in that way. Because, like, there's not, like, there's not going to be a thing. You know, yeah, it was really, it was interesting and beautiful. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you already have that bully in your mind and then the outside bullies validate the same thoughts you have. That is when, I mean, that is when you break down. That is when your entire identity becomes evolving around what you believe and what others have said about you as well. That is why growing up in safe environments, even school and the home environment, is really important. The combination of safe at school and safe at home is necessary for you to build that unbreakable sense of self. Because bullying is, is always in the, in the hand of the bully. But if you're receiving that bullying and you are, you're, your, you know, your mindset is shaped by what they are saying about you. That is going to follow with you the rest of your life. Whereas if you're really secure, that thing can bounce off much easier. 
you will be able to confront it, confront it in healthy ways as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the beautiful thing about like what I envision is like, I don't see my kids going to school, mm -hmm. like personally. And I think, you know, the opportunity of, of co-creating harmonious community makes that possible also. Mm -hmm. Like it's not natural this way that we've decided to do things in this Western society. It's like not natural at all. It doesn't make sense really. Like this idea, especially as a mother, like I just don't fully understand it. I mean, I do and I have compassion and, and I understand the ways that these things have evolved to be the way that they are. But like, that's not how I envision raising my family, like mm -hmm. sending my kids off to be open to that kind of treatment just doesn't make sense. We have the potential and the ability to curate an environment for our children and the future generations where mm -hmm. The children that they're working with or collaborating with and being raised around, the ones that they're siblings with, friends with, in, in, a, in a hub environment, are raised on the same principles as them. Yeah. They have the same values, the same... Um, perspect Not perspectives, because everyone has a different view, but everyone's going everyone's holistically treating each other better because everyone holistically is being taught that that's fundamentally how we treat each other. Like no, there's no circumstance where people are like put into silos and being mistreated and then have to lash out viciously on one another. Like that doesn't make sense in a, in a natural healthy environment yeah. but that's not the one we've existed in it's just the one that we get to like envision moving forward and actually like create if that's mm -hmm. what we're here to do which i believe is mm -hmm. one of the reasons i'm here you know and so um i agree and i also see how the whole point, the whole point of doing anything in, in life, I, for my perspective, is like to be able to bring my children up in a better way. Yeah. And to be able to like be the one that raises them, you know, mm -hmm. and be among people I trust who can help raise them and uplift them into being the very best versions of themselves not mm -hmm. just like sending kids off to do like miscellaneous activities with random people that we don't even know where they're being treated poorly. It just mm -hmm. fundamentally doesn't even click. Yeah. Or even being overstimulated by all of that constant action, action, action. I mean, as adults, we can't handle it. Why would we force children to go through it? And it's also our responsibility to break that that pattern of how parents have raised their children I mean, even so we don't put it on our offspring it mm -hmm. starts with us even sharing those principles with the children it is not what they are being taught what they are hearing it's what they are experiencing i mean i can share a lot of value with my offspring but if what they see is me and my partner arguing or our relationship being a bully or narcissistic or manipulative in any way, that is what they will learn. They will not learn what we are teaching them. They will not learn the manners. They will, you know, we are the ones that are leading by example. And that is why we have to heal our wounds before we actually bring it out to the mini version of our, ourselves. Yeah. Because either way, we can have the best school system, we can have, you know, the best environments for our children, but it's still our responsibility that our demons do not leak out on them. Absolutely. Know thyself. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so true. That is so true. Yeah. yeah. And 
it's interesting because in the in the topic of bullying and how we are processing those as you said demons um mm -hmm. and holding space for those those things it is it's a huge responsibility because <clears throat> exactly like you said like the children our children are not going to it's like monkey see monkey do they're not going to hear our words and then take them on they're going mm -hmm. to actually like emulate what it is that we embody and so that's why it's interesting because the bully in in my mind is like bullying me about not embodying better <laughs> then it's like well what in your mind i mean we're adults carrying our bullies in our head but who started that chain who started that because it always you know accelerates from there so you had one mean thing being told or an unpleasant event happening to you and you're building your self-worth from there and since we haven't really done anything about it up until now it might have been 20 years or you know more or less that you've been carrying those beliefs so going back to where did it start why what i mean what caused it and was it actually my fault because oftentimes we're blaming ourselves for something we didn't do only because the, you were the target of that hate absolutely that's why i was so like in gratitude that this young girl is like not going to experience 30 years of that you know because just because of the simple holding space and conversation and that was one thing I was also like just observing was like how much the distractions really cause adults to miss mm -hmm. what's really happening yeah. in their children's lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not a judgment, it's just an observation and, and an awareness because it creates the opportunity for us to show up differently as well like being able to realize like if i'm so fixated and focused on um what i'm like doing then i'm missing the fact that like my kids being bullied like my kids being my kids like watching some crap garbage you know what i mean and like doesn't even like boom, like right over the head like that's just another activity thing i've got to do this do that do this do this did you do that did you do that and then like call it a day just got to get through the week and it's mm -hmm. like no like mm -hmm. what are what has happened here um but also like empowerment because it's like i know where i'm going like mm -hmm. i know the direction that we're going to take it and you're right i think that there's a huge responsibility in um clearing out the wounds so that they can be healed and we're not bleeding all over the youth <laughs> and then like having that be like oh, <laughs> inside of them and buried as thorns because that's so much like that you know like you said going back to the um depth of like why is that bully there or where did it come from that's a big part of it it's yeah. like being around generations of like un unhealed just traumas like just seeping out at any target you know yeah, um, yeah very you're the parent the unhealed parent and you have your child expressing to you what is happening chances are you will be seeing it through your own lens and what you went through in your own bullying experience and that trigger is not going to be helpful for your child to experience because chances are you will be frantic or you know heaving and it's just so uncomfortable for you because your child is still an extension of you mm -hmm. in a way that that child becomes the parent becomes your parent because you are not emotionally available to deal with that absolutely like that's one thing that i've been reflecting on too and it's definitely true like your child should not be your best friend no like that's really like a child parent relationship 
it should actually not be reciprocal until they maybe get older. Hmm. But like you, it, and it, this happens a lot with single mothers as well. Like hmm. it's a very interesting phenomenon, but like your kid is not your husband. Like <laughs> your kid is not your friend. Like your child is your child. Like you're there to pour into them not have it be this like weird thing where then like they need to be your emotional support too. And it happens a lot. And I think it makes like, it, it's understandable, but it's not healthy. And, um, and that's one of the thing that perpet one of the things that perpetuates that, um, bullying in essence, because it, the foundation is not solid. It's like, mm -hmm it's shaky and a little bit even volatile because it creates an environment where you don't really know what, how, like what's mom going to be like today or what's dad going to be like today. Mm -hmm. Um, because like five minutes ago we were laughing and it, everything was cool. And then like, suddenly I didn't, you know, um, do this one thing and it's like, poof, like explosion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't have fun, like obviously have tons of fun and play and everything. Um, and I'm not an expert or anything like that. I'm just, I'm grateful that as I am, am showing up and embodying my fullest and being myself that I'm coming more into clarity and, um, alignment with my truth of that or my greatest job is to be a mother. Like that's one of the mm -hmm. most important things I can possibly do with my life. And so that's why the healing work right now has been so important. And it's like, I'm just pouring all of my energy into that to be mm -hmm. able to be a really a clear channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is when the, when our adult life bullies in our head, they will seep out, unfortunately. So that is why we want to confront them mm -hmm. before things get really, before we bleed out on our loved ones. Yeah. 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 I've definitely learned from that, from those kinds of experiences of not um, always proudest of some of those moments, but in a reframing and a, in a, in a healing way, I'm mm -hmm. grateful for the lessons that they taught me you know yeah and we have to create those safe spaces too like you said that one moment the family you know the family system you know, we're laughing we're having fun and the next moment it becomes a bit intimidating and for a child not to know where where your situation lies with your parents if you cannot feel safe then how can you be safe to express that yeah thing that is happening so a lot of fear is within the family and the fear of consequence as well because if you were taught if if you, let's say you were bullied in school and you you were you learned from that experience that you are wrong and you learn from the experience at home that when you're wrong there will be consequences so how can you openly express to your caregivers your parents that something is happening to me without being punished for it yeah. and that is why a lot of the bullying the the victims of bullies they pour it inside themselves because either there will be consequences or there will be no reaction at all or no action that will prevent the bullying from happening so having a safe space for the victims of bullying is really important and then we, I think we still have a long way to go when it comes to those safe spaces for them. Yeah. I think, it, I mean, it starts in the home. It really does. Like, mm -hmm. it starts and ends in the home, <laughs> you know? That was one thing I remember when I was, I had these deep meditations, like, several years ago, um, asking God about my purpose. And it was like, well, you know, we were talking about this in the in our group chat the other day of like, or was it yesterday? Of like all the different aspects of, you know, like yoga and the energy that comes through that, and that like one one, one woman's perspective, which I just mm -hmm. fundamentally think is 
a little bit out there, um, which we don't have to get all into. But um, in that period of time, there were these really deep meditations that I was experiencing about purpose and, and surrendering to hear the message clearly. And the message came through that I'm here to help and abuse on all levels. Mm. And that starts in the home of society and then the home of our local communities and then in the home of the home and the home which homes us, which is the body. Yeah. And I was like, dang it, man, can't you just have said my purpose was gonna be like. (laughs) I want the easy way. (laughs) (laughs) That was actually not my response then. It's my response now because I'm like, oh, but I'm so I'm down for it, you know, and I'm here for it. And I'm like, let's go. Like, let's not let anything stop that. Because it, nobody, nobody talks about the actual process of that, it seems like. And that's why I am so grateful for it what we are co-creating and how we can bring people to a space where like that's actually the focus because everyone yells at you to heal and like be better and show mm-hmm. up and be a leader and do all these things and nobody really shows what does that mean like yeah. what does healing mean what does that mean exactly yeah. Um, and so it's it's an interesting experience because it's, it is it can't be taught, it's learned, but it can't be taught, mm-hmm. and that's so like honestly kind of frustrating. But that's the kind of thing that like, I mean, even in the example of this conversation that we had, where she was able to go in and be that like version of herself, the most in the most mm-hmm. empowered state, and confronting through um, the alchemy that we collectively you know performed i couldn't have taught her that she learned it through the process of us experiencing all of the different scenarios in a safe Mm -hmm. space but i couldn't have taught her that i couldn't have been like here's what you're gonna say here's you know i couldn't have sat down and and controlled that experience Mm -hmm. for her the end of the day if she wasn't embodying the vibration it wouldn't have been received yeah and that's not something that can be taught and it's not something that we can um like study intellectually like and we need to just be able to like vibrationally experience it to actually alchemize and so it's like interesting because we have an opportunity um to reshape what that looks like in the home. And it's like, yes, I think in some ways, you know, what you said is true. Like we do have a long way to go. And I also think, why, why do we have a long way to go? Like, isn't this what we're doing right now? Creating that space. Like, even if we're doing it at a micro level, who's to say that that's not the most effective way, you know? So Mm -hmm. I always, and, and I think this is something that's been a dance with the two of us that I'm so grateful for because what you what you are voicing is like the a voice inside of me as well mm-hmm. that I can be like I get to verbally challenge whenever you say that and realize <laughs> that that's the more and that's the more empowered state. It's like yeah, we have a long way to go, and yeah, but if you're like. But we can't just have it all at once. And I'm like, I fundamentally I'm Swedish, remember. <laughs> this is <laughs> what did you say? I'm Swedish, don't forget that. <laughs> what is being said? Oh, that's one of the things you said. Yeah, yeah. Like, what is that to do? I was about to do it again. Like, what does being Swedish have to do with anything with that? We're kind of like, like mm, but maybe this. Um, I see. Okay, we'll see if that happens. Yeah, maybe, okay. And I'm like, what is that? Like, yeah, so I, I'm just trying to imagine what I could do, like, in the Swedish culture. I'm like, what did I bring? How did I say anything about Swedish culture? Like, no, no but you're like, action. This is how things can go to create change. And a limiting part of me is also like, yes, we can follow that. But realistically, maybe in 20 years, there will be, you know, a solution. But we can still do this. There's That's the thing. You have to challenge your beliefs, too. Yeah. Why can't it be tomorrow? I mean, why can't suddenly everything shift? And well, yeah, 
who said we have 20 years is the other part of it. And mm -hmm. that's like one of the, and I'm not <laughs> saying it in a scary way, I'm just saying it in like, what is that idea? Like that is like, it's like, yeah, we like one day it'll be that way. But it's like, who said one day exists? Like, you know, I'm not trying to intimidate, but I'm just saying like, I'm not content with that. Like, yeah. and I think that's where my bully starts getting. I'm like, no, like it has to be now. Like, I'm not going to be patient about this. Like yeah. it needs to be right now. And then I'm like meditating and I'm like floating and I'm like, <laughs> is my foot levitating off the floor now? Make it, make it, make it. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Take me. There we go. Nope. All right. Let's try again. Like, okay. you have 20 years. <laughs> no, I'm like, and then I'm like, I don't know that I have the 20 years. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, so, and that's that's the thing. It's like I just I think the more that we can like pull into the belief that like yeah we're doing it now, like we're doing it right now. Like that's the only thing that actually exists. Like this whole other like one day thing, not mm -hmm. really. Like I think it's great to have a target and like you know compound and be like yes we're gonna do this every single day. And then eventually, if I do this every single day, I mean, it's important to do that because then otherwise, if, what's the point? Like, if we don't have tomorrow, then like, shoot, then like, I don't have to do all of these cardio workouts and I don't have to like, you know, but that's not the reason we're doing it. No. It's mm -hmm. for the every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, the commitment to yourself. Exactly. It's for the discipline. It's for the, no, I like, even if it all ended right now, I still took care of the things I committed to myself to take care of incrementally. Even if it was just a small thing that I could, that I could do today, I still chose to do it. And I still allowed myself to become a little bit more embodied in these aspects and with that fundamental belief, there's no limitation that we couldn't bungee jump to the next thing. And, mm. or bungee jump's not the best example. Because <laughs> you jump down. <laughs> You're going back, you have it down. But you understand what I mean. Like, it's, I, why couldn't we quantum leap into the next? Yeah. And so that's why I'm looking forward to reading U squared with you and, um, yeah. and exploring that as well. Yeah. That will be very insightful. Yeah. Hmm. So how can we, I mean, we really, we, we have to be in the here and now. Well, how do we go about facing the challenges of bullying? And let's say the bullying is more to the extreme. I mean, actually physically and psychologically damaging. What can, how can we help others? to get through that? It's an interesting question because it's like in the here and now, how can we handle something that's not in the here and now? <laughs> but I understand fundamentally what you're asking. And, you know, I think the more that we are able to embody on principle spaces where that's fundamentally not okay, mm -hmm. I think that that's the most immediate here and now thing that we can do because it creates an environment to where we're prepared to where if that is the thing that's happening in the here and now, like, and she came home with a black eye or something and walked in the door right now, that mm -hmm. I would be prepared to handle that circumstance, which is more dire than the other one, like you, mm -hmm. you, know, you had said. Um, and also, I think um, in the here and now, clarity on... Mm -hmm how we can co-create a different kind of environment for that future that might take 20 years, right? 
Um, but now being able to open up the space to be like, okay, what does it look like to raise children in an environment where these things are not their lived experience? You know, what does it look like to have a community like in reality, you know, and not like just these, um, like group chats and stuff like that, which are great. But, um, I know that's like not the exact direct answer to your question, but that's the best thing I can think of right now, because in the here and now we're able to focus on moving forward. Yeah. Well, let's frame it with the adult bullies in our life. Because that would change the situation because we can handle it right away. And we don't have to put it on on the child as a responsible person to deal with it because we can form our own opinion and our own conclusion to, to actually confront the bully. Because we, as adults, we can have bullies on our work workspace. We can have bullies in the families. Yeah. Uh, our, yeah, internal bullies as well. It's a whole different scenario when you're an adult and having to face these negative beliefs. And then I think as an adult, it's not not so much who is saying it. It is the actual, it's the action itself that is hurtful. Mm-hmm. As a child, you're more, say, you're more sensitive to who it is that is breaking your trust. Whereas as an adult, it's the trust has already been broken. It's the the fact that the bullying and the mean and harsh words are happening. That is the that is the challenge in itself. Yeah. Do you feel like you have an example in your life where that's something that's prevalent? Well, I mean, for as a personal example, growing up being. Um, experiencing bullying in my life made me believe that my words were not valuable to express, which up until very recently meant extreme social anxiety and not being able to talk in front of people or even look people in the eye. Whereas it all started with the belief from early on in my life that whatever I would say, there would be consequences and no one would actually want to hear what I'm saying. But today, that is something that is within me. That is my limiting belief. And if anyone in my surroundings makes me feel that my words are invaluable, I will withdraw instead of actually confronting it or feeling in myself, why do I believe it this way? So in a way, you know, someone created that pattern within you. And as an adult, it is not, I can't be more disappointed at people I'm already disappointed at. So I just pour it into myself instead. And that is why the bully grows within you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um I think the key in that is that nobody actually created that pattern in you. We individually had the mental and physical faculties to create that pattern within ourselves. It might have been coming from the external. It wasn't necessarily anyone's fault or your fault for having experienced that. But nobody can create a pattern in us. We create the pattern. And there's liberty in that. Because whenever we can realize that if we created that pattern, then we can create a different one. Even if it's been 20 years. Yeah. We can create a different one. And so recognizing, like, by holding the space for it within our own selves. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm experiencing this pattern again, you know. Um, labeling it, reframing it, and moving forward, I think is a really big practice that I've 
been putting into practice mm -hmm. instead of holding all of the like feelings in it and ugh, <laughs> like about it you know no. and just being <laughs> like, like being able to call it what it is like you had said if um you know you can't be more disappointed than with somebody than you already are so you just pour that disappointment into yourself it's like well, and I know on your inner work journey that this is something that you're already confronting. So it's not like this is new. Like the fact that you were able to say that is a testament to like your awareness of it, right? Um, and deeper or in the next level, like recognizing, okay, um, I'll give an example of how like, Dr. Fellingham wrote it in her book. It's like, okay, if you're experiencing a negative thought or if you're experiencing the disappointment from, from external of someone else, right? And then you turn that disappointment on yourself, recognizing that pattern and being like, oh, that's not like me. I usually don't experience disappointment. Mm. I'm going to move forward with, um, you know, feeling content. Yeah. It's interesting because it's like you're we're labeling it as like not you're no longer identifying with it. Like, oh, here comes my disappointment pattern again. It's like, no, like, oh, that's unlike me. I don't usually experience this anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's unlike me. I'm really good at receiving love. So this is an interesting thing that's coming up. I'm going to let myself feel satisfaction in this moment. Yeah. Like the the shifting of that, I think, is one of the best um, ways to do that. And then, even if we're hand, even if there's an external experience of like bullying, then it's the opportunity to be like, "Oh, that's weird. I usually am not affected by other people's opinions mm -hmm. of me." Yeah. Huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna move forward with what I know to be true about me. Mm -hmm. so i think that that's that's interesting but you know you talked about something that i don't want to just like gloss over like when things are a lot more um dire circumstances like i've definitely been in circumstances with very hurt individuals who have a lot of pain to volatilely volatilely i don't know if that's word in a volatile way, sort of like seep out to the world. And then I put myself in the predicament where I was the target and able to just like have to take that all the time. Um, but I think that that's the empowerment piece is like recognizing that that was my choice. It's not like a choice that I was happy to make even at the time. I just was limited by what I thought was realistic in my choices in those moments. And so I went back to something that was familiar, even though it wasn't healthy. And so as adults, like we have a lot more autonomy than we do as children. You don't get to really, excuse me, choose as a child unless you're in a in an environment where your voice and opinions and choices are really like valued and respected in a way that is um that actually can make a difference you don't really get to choose where you go to school what even like sports you play and all that kind of stuff so then if you're being mistreated in those spaces it's like already ugh, like i have to be here and now i have to be treated poorly here but as an adult we're able to be like f this like this is not it like goodbye but because we oftentimes grew up in environments where we didn't have those choices we're limited by the um disbelief in ourself and so mm -hmm. the shift toward believing in ourselves is a daily healing practice that we get to take part in yeah yeah exactly that is when our limitations from younger age hinder us from moving forward as adults, where in reality, there's no one that actually can stop us if we need to change a circumstance. I know some circumstances are more difficult to get out of, but let's say a difficult job situation or 
being somewhere where it doesn't feel right, you still have the choice. Whereas as a child, you were so dependent on the adults and what they had shaped your days. So yeah, absolutely being an adult is, that is why all the healing comes when you are an adult. This is when you actually get to process it and just dissect everything until you find, find where that negative belief comes from. Yeah. And then shifting it, labeling it, moving forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that actually serves. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too. <laughs> Mm -hmm. is there anything else on your heart space that you'd like to share or ask or anything what I want to add is how important it is that our identity is solid so that no one else can change our identity or make us believe something that is not true to ourselves mm -hmm. we're working very early on with shaping who you are and not being rebranded by anyone else's opinions. That's so deep. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. That's something that I've definitely played with a lot and I'm working on myself. Like what is, what is it to have an unshakable sense of self? Because in healing, like, codependency patterns, instead of needing other people's approval or needing other people to need me in any way, being invited into spaces because, just because I'm loved, is like, yeah. what? <laughs> you know, like, what? Yeah. Um, and then being able to have that solid space of self in identity and also in no identity at all, because that's how, that's like the vibrational truth, truth, mm. but being able to have like the sense of self in that is a very interesting dance yeah. because it's like an evolution, uh, evolution, evolution and elevation. Um, from having no positive self-image to having a positive self-image to having a firm, unshakable self-identity to realizing the truth that we don't have identity at all. Mm. That's an interesting thing to play with and to reflect on today. Mm. Yeah, it's very layered. Mm. Thank you. I really appreciate this. <laughs> It'll be interesting moving forward as we continue having these kinds of conversations and opening up spaces for other people to uplift themselves and uplift each other in the process. And I'm curious, could you share with everybody where about your channel, about where we can support you and what the best way to support you might be? Thank you. So I started my YouTube channel called The Awakened Somnambulist. And I talk about the awakening from, from trauma and from sleepwalking throughout your life. And the somnambulist is a sleepwalker. Where I got that inspiration is when you are in a traumatized state, you are disassociating daily, which feels like you're sleepwalking throughout your life. And the awakening is when you shift and understand that you don't have to sleepwalk any longer. And so I discuss on the topics of the steps. Firstly, since it's such a new channel, the idea of how you step by step come out of that traumatized state. Mm. I also have a blog called the blog.theawakensomnambulist.com. It is an extension to my channel, whereas I write more creatively and freely and add some bullet points or journal prompts in the post so that you can have a more reflective type of understanding of that phase 
instead of only watching me speak on it. Absolutely. I love that. And you can find all of that linked in the Art Hills Earth blog that yeah. also Ida writes, which we love your newsletter. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And those are all linked at www.earthschoolskool.org. And we can make sure that everyone has access to your channel as well and the description of this video. So that's going to be really cool and awesome. And I appreciate that. And um, I like to like pull into <laughs> our acceptedness before just being like, okay, we did that. Bye. You know, um, <laughs> Just breathing. <sighs> you know, I saw something the other day that made me think of that title that you had just shared because I read um, something that brought the realization that trauma is the dream wound. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not real. But it's illu the, in the illusion we experience it and it's a part of our consciousness even though it's not here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, pulling into the presence of what is here now. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. Thank I always you. feel so inspired when talking to you. That Thank, means you. Thank you very much. <laughs>